briefly, for those of you who missed the first one, a lot of it was about one-dimensional hydrodynamics and how you get a different form of hydrodynamics than what we're used to, basically because there are more conservation laws, at least in many of the simplified Hamiltonians we deal with, like the Hubbard model or the Lieb-Linegar, Bose gas, or whatever. Uh, so I want to say about 15 more minutes probably about one dimension today, which is just to answer the question of uh, if we get away from these so-called integrable systems where strictly speaking the conductivity is infinite and things propagate without relaxing because of the structures I told you about last time, if we get a little bit closer to reality, uh, what happens? Uh, how does this alternative hydrodynamics get modified? Um, and I have two answers to that. One is relevant for solids and one is relevant for atomic physics maybe. And then most of the lecture is actually going to be going up to two and three dimensions and uh, trying to connect a bit more to experiments. And here I will uh, assume that most of you saw Andy McKenzie's lecture. I even have one slide from his lecture that I'll remind you of. Uh, there may be one or two things I would stress some theoretical reasons for caring about. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about optics, actually. So uh, I am a theorist, as you've probably gathered, but I, I thought I would talk about experiments because the cups say experiment is motivation times coffee squared, E is MC squared, and I didn't say any cups for theory. I don't know what theory is, but I know what experiment is now. So uh, I'll try to uh, talk about experiment, even though I'm a theorist. And in particular, the main th technique I thought I would introduce uh, there's a way to do transport at, say, micron wave vectors using high-frequency optics uh, that led to some classic results in the mid-2000s, say, so-called transient grading optics. Uh, and I think that some of those results are actually about one of the questions that's already come up a lot in this meeting, which is the diffusive to hydrodynamic to ballistic crossover. Um, so how can you see that without having to make contacts and things like that? And, you know, this doesn't work in every material, but it famously works in uh, gallium arsenide two-dimensional electron gases where people like Lorenz Mollenkamp showed us a long time ago that there could be hydrodynamical effects. And then finally, at the end, if there's time, uh, you might have heard some news about hydrodynamical behavior in transport and wild semi-metals. I, I don't have anything to say about that, really. Maybe there in transport, the experimental situation may still be a little complicated, but... Uh, for optics, there are some neat things that happen. So this is kind of the transition from ordinary transport to transport-like things with optics. But first, 1D. So uh, one reason why we care about one-dimensional systems is they famously violate the standard wisdom that metals are Fermi liquids. So if you're in higher dimensions above one and you add repulsive interactions between the electrons, we think going back to Landau that usually the picture is pretty stable. Uh, you no longer have a Fermi gas. You have renormalizations of the electron effective mass and other things, but your basic picture of the excitations is still okay. Uh, now you have an electron that's dressed by some particle hole pairs, and that's the Fermi liquid. Uh, in 1D, we think that's not true, that in general, uh, I'm sorry, the right-hand got, side got cut off, but if you take one-dimensional metals, you turn on repulsive interactions, you get a so-called Luttinger liquid. Uh, you've at low energy, that's kind of a, a free boson theory. It's very uh, remarkable that interacting fermions are related to free bosons. Um, but it turns out that uh, these integrability ideas and perturbations to the Luttinger liquid tell you how you actually measure finite conductivities when the Luttinger liquid itself would have ballistic conductivity. Um, so this is basically, we think, the generic state of one-dimensional solids. Um, and there are cases where you might have spin chains in a 3D material that are pretty Luttinger liquid-like as well. Um, so that's my solid state bit. My atomic bit for breaking integrability is a lot of the models we care about, like for example, the Bose gas with delta function interactions in a tube of atoms, that is integrable. And the interaction really is very close to delta function, so that's not a big problem. Uh, the problem is that you normally put your atoms in a harmonic confining potential to keep them from flying apart, and the model is no longer strictly integrable once you put it in a potential. Uh, so we studied that a bit, and one reason for doing that is there's a classical model of hard rods uh, that is somewhat analogous or the simplest example of the kind of hydrodynamical equation I talked about before. It's uh, been studied for a long, long time, going back to Perkis in the 60s, and I wanted to say a few words about it because really it's the simplest example where I can actually write down and say some analytical things about this funny kind of hydrodynamics in 1D, and then we'll go on to higher dimensions. Okay, so quickly, uh, solid state reality, at least for one-dimensional systems, would be 
a little bit more complicated than something like this. So this is the integrable model that I showed some checks on last time. This is the XXZ spin chain. And if I wanted to break integrability, uh, I could add either a random or a staggered magnetic field over here. So a random field will tend to localize. By staggered field, I mean it's one that's, say, up on even sites and down on odd sites. Uh, and that will, I'll try to convince you, that will break integrability uh, and give me a real one-dimensional metal, a Luttinger liquid. Um, so if you wonder why do I call it a metal when this is a spin model, well, this is equivalent through a nice canonical transformation to a model of spinless fermions with nearest neighbor interactions. Uh, so, and again, a nice thing about this model, especially if it's not random, uh, this is very numerically accessible with modern techniques. And I, I'm not doing justice to the people who do those calculations uh, by not telling you how they're done, but they're very impressive. So an example of this one-dimensional metal idea, just to try to convince you that it's interesting. So if I came to you as a solid state physicist and said, look, take a one-dimensional metal, you know, let's make it simple, let's forget about spin, so there's no on-site interaction, the only interaction is nearest neighbor, then as I change the strength of the nearest neighbor interaction in a metal, if it were a normal metal, you'd think, well, you know, it's still going to be basically the same. Uh, it sort of remains in the same phase even in the one-dimensional case, but the basic physics is a bit different. So. What's universal are things like the low energy specific heat. Uh, it's always a central charge equal to one theory in fancy terms. But to be precise, you could say the interactions are marginal and take me between a line of one dimensional critical points. And the one magic parameter that we use to sort of characterize how the different one dimensional metals with different interaction strength are different is sometimes called Luttinger parameter. So that's actually a measured quantity in some one dimensional system. So for example, Amir has measured that by tunneling on one-dimensional quantum wires. Um, so I, I'm not going to say a whole lot about Luttinger liquid background. I just want to show you some uh, reasons why we know it's true and that we know we can compute things pretty well in 1D. So maybe the simplest feature of the Luttinger liquid to keep in mind and to isolate how it's different from a Fermi liquid is the following. If you had a free Fermi gas, there's a Fermi surface, and at the Fermi surface, the momentum occupancy jumps from one inside the Fermi surface to zero outside. If you take a Fermi liquid, then it still jumps. There's still a jump at the Fermi surface, but the jump is by some smaller amount we call Z, quasi-particle residue. And if you take a Luttinger liquid in 1D, then, well, there's still a Fermi point. The number of electrons hasn't changed. Uh, but instead, there's a cusp-like behavior in N sub K which means in real space, there's a power law correlation. Uh, I guess this is real space over here. This is momentum space there. But we can resolve the cusp, you know, the exponents of this and the leading correlation and the subleading piece and all that uh, very well with numerics these days. So Luttinger liquids are not particularly mysterious, at least in a solvable model like XXZ. So now, let's make it not solvable. Uh, so we want to preserve some level of translation and variance, but break integrability. And one way that integrability is testable is uh, so-called level statistics, which is saying, if I've got an energy eigenvalue at E, what is the chance that I have another energy eigenvalue at some small distance delta E? So these are histograms, counting levels, and the horizontal axis is energy difference. So the integrable model has what are called Poisson statistics, which means uh, if you have an energy level then at one energy, then that has no influence. It's an independent process whether you have another energy level nearby. While real non-integrable models have the famous Wigner-Dyson level repulsion, which is that if you have a quantum chaotic model, in general, once you have an energy level, uh, you're less likely to have an energy level right away. Uh, so generic quantum models are the way waiting for the bus is supposed to be. Uh, and the Poisson process is the way that waiting for the bus actually is, is a way to remember. Because here, you know, the bus comes and then another bus comes, which shouldn't happen, but it does. While here, they're really repelling each other at least a little bit, not perfectly. So what this means is we can add this integrability breaking term and uh, see that we've really broken integrability in the model. And if you want to know why integral models don't have level repulsion, it's that in general, there's so many quantum numbers that any nearby energy levels are likely to be different in some quantum number, so they don't repel each other. Uh, where repulsion comes from, at least the simplest picture of it, is that 
if I had two levels close together, then any small perturbation would tend to drive them apart strongly because the energy denominator is small. Assuming they're mixed by the perturbation, in integral models, they're not likely to be mixed by the perturbation. Anyway, so what we can make with this term is a set of Luttinger liquids that are all asymptotically the same at long distances. So this is a renormalization group trajectory. I added some extra field. It's irrelevant, so I'm still getting the Luttinger liquid. And all of these would have the same long distance power laws and so on. They're all the same metal, ultimately. Uh, but they differ in the strength of this perturbation. And you can actually measure the conductivity. So now, this is just verifying that it's really a metal once we break integrability. It doesn't have any unusual length dependence. It's got a bona fide DC conductivity. But that D DC conductivity blows up as a power law. That's the consequence of the irrelevance. Uh, so if you add an irrelevant perturbation, you'd expect its impact to go to zero as you go to low temperature. Uh, so basically, the conductivity blows up as the perturbation into the negative 2 power and the temperature to some power that depends on the Luttinger parameter. Uh, so this is similar in spirit, but different in the details from the kind of Luttinger tunneling uh, that was measured by Mirce or Luttinger compressibility that was measured by Schall. Uh, here, this is determined by the leading operator that allows backscattering of the current. Uh, but again, you get fractional power laws. So that's maybe not so surprising in a Luttinger liquid. OK, so now on to atoms. Uh, and please you know, interrupt if you have. Uh, yes? But this was with impurities then. Uh, it was not exactly impurities. I mean, it, I would say it's breaking integrability, Whoop, sorry, oh, by, uh, but by a staggered field. So what I mean is uh, this minus 1 to the i means up, down, up, down. Yeah. So I think if I add impurities, then I often get localization in this model. <coughs> Good question. Yeah, well, so the usual Luttinger liquid has finite conductance but infinite conductivity. Uh, so here, the actual conductivity is finite. So as I, in, the, in the unperturbed Luttinger liquid, uh, as I make it longer and longer, so I guess it depends on my order of limits. But if I, if, I took, if I got rid of this term, then I would just see e squared over h, however far apart the leads are. And then with this term, I'll see that the conductance goes like 1 over L. Uh, it will satisfy Ohm's law because of the integrability breaking. At, now, it, if I'm at some non-zero temperature, uh, then I will see that if I'm much longer, uh, if I'm shorter than some scale set by the temperature, then it will look like the Luttinger case. Yeah, but let's say this power exponent that you showed for conductivity that should relate to some kind of scattering related to this integrability break. Exactly. Can you can you say anything about from where this power exponent comes from? It's a little strange that this is a power law. I would expect it to be expanded. Um, well, OK, this is exactly at half filling. That's one thing. If I'm away from half filling, it's a little different. Yeah. Uh, so, And if you want, the power law was actually computed by Affleck and Serker and Pereira, if I remember. Uh, so there were more or less two scenarios for how this would behave, and we see the Affleck at all one pretty well. Yeah, so that power exponent is a specific point. Exactly. Yeah, if you tuned away from half filling, I think it would be it could be exponential. Exponential. Yeah. That's what I, okay. So how would this look in real space if you can image how the voltage drops across the wire? So some of the at least at average would drop on the contact. Uh, that's right. I think at le but at least at long distances, you would it would start to look like Ohm's law. Uh, so th there would be a contact piece, but also a uh, Ohm's law piece in the middle. So there is dissipation in the middle. The, the linear, I mean 1 over L. It's, it, it, so, not as function of L, but just image at the given L how it looks in real space. It would not look like a power law. Oh, no, it's a linear. It, I mean, I think it's, I think, at least I think uh, we did not do that real space calculation, but it, it's basically a resistive material now. It has dissipation. So you will get that the voltage is moving linearly between the two endpoints. If I make a circle, like a, uh, a circle out of uh, this thing, and set up current, and you're saying it will decay because there is conductivity, so uh, 
to, to into what will it decay? Like, uh, well, there's no momentum there's no momentum conservation because it's you know it, 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 if you want I'm I'm at a filling that allows a lot of umclap, uh, and I'm on a lattice. Uh, so that's one answer. And the second answer is that with a ring, you know, there is this famous Thouless versus Flutter thing. With a ring, it's surprisingly hard to get the E squared over H quantization. Uh, that's somehow the magic of contacts. So, but maybe that's a separate topic. I think uh, the, yeah, the, the, it's key that momentum is not conserved, definitely. Good. So onward. Um, OK. So Adams, uh, and this model, it turns out, is beloved by mathematicians who want to prove rigorous things about hydrodynamics. So the quantum model of bosons moving in a trap is measured in atomic laboratories, but is hard and complicated. And I don't really have much to say about it. There are nice papers about it by other people in the last year or so. Uh, I want to start with something simpler, which is classical hard rods in a trap. Uh, and, and that's because the kind of hydrodynamic equation you get is exactly the same as for the quantum model. So for those of you who missed the first lecture, the punchline was that quantum integrable systems have a kind of kinetic theory equation, this, what we call the Beta-Boltzmann equation, that is actually very much like classical integral models. This is a really simple classical integral model where I've got a bunch of rods moving in 1D that can't overlap each other. And another way to think about it is that when two rods hit each other, it's almost like uh, a particle has jumped by a distance the length of the rod, and then they, they move apart. So it's just rods colliding elastically. Um, and then I'm going to add a potential here. So this does not have dissipation. It's integral. And people like Spohn, who want to do hydrodynamics rigorously, this is one of the models that has been most studied. Uh, and the reason for caring is that people have spent a lot of time trying to do dynamics of one-dimensional bosons in a trap. This is this famous uh, quantum Newton's cradle experiment that basically found that if you put bosons in a quadratic trap, it seems to take an awfully long time to thermalize, among other things. So one reason for studying this, the classical model, we can go to very long time limits and understand basically that there are two hydrodynamic regimes. Uh, the story is going to be that the simple thing is not quite, what we thought would be true is not quite true. Uh, we thought that at short times we could ignore the integrability breaking by the trap and just put in the forcing from the trap in a simple way uh, and get a kind of hydrodynamics. And that's true for short times. But at long times, what happens is more complicated. There's sort of two long time regimes, and neither one is thermal, at least up to 1,000 or so periods that we can study. Um, so the figures I'm going to show, if you want to learn more, are from that paper. And the answer is that they're basically three regimes. There's integral hydrodynamics, then there's a sort of development of chaos, and then the long time behavior is another application of hydrodynamics. And here, this is uh, the slide that I flashed to in response to a question before. The simplest example of this special kind of 1D hydrodynamics was written down a long time ago by Perkis. The idea is that this is like a Boltzmann equation with no force and with the velocity of one rod, or sorry, a velocity at one momentum that depends in this way on the density of other rods of other momenta uh, in the same fluid cell, same point in space time. Uh, so you can see that the effective uh, velocities increase from what it would be, which is just p, by the fact that when two rods hit, it's almost like one of them jumps over the other. I mean, they exchange their velocities, to be precise. So you add the external potential. And then what maybe is not surprising is it's hydrodynamic according to this equation for a little while. Eventually, it's chaotic because it's non-integrable now. And you can see Lyapunov exponents and other signs of chaos. The thing which we weren't expecting is that if you take, OK, so what does it mean for a system to be thermal? Uh, the strong version of it is that you take one state, and you evolve it for a very long time, and you take a window of time to average over at the end. And averages over that time window start to look like thermal averages. Uh, so that doesn't hold here. Um, what you get instead, for example, is depending on what initial state you start with, you get different non-Gaussian velocity profiles in the long time average. And again, this is a classical system, so the numerics are not as challenging as they would be in the quantum case. But even though it's not thermalizing, and you know, maybe it's not that surprising that it's not thermalizing, because we know that in classical finite body systems, you often have coexistence of chaotic regimes with nearly integrable regimes. So this is a so-called point Poincaré map. Basically, you're taking a snapshot of the system after every collision and asking where the rods were for three rods. And if you ever took a class on chaos or a lecture or two, you'll have seen pictures like this where 
There are regions of the diagram that look almost like a harmonic oscillator or something. And then there are regions that are fractal or dusty that are really uh, chaos. So this is just zooming in on that. And they're all the kind of pretty structures that you expect in classical chaos. Come. Yes, that's a, this is a classical few-body system. So, uh, and as usual, you know, the bounds from the Kama theorem are very uh, small regions of phase space, but a much larger part of phase space is actually not chaotic than than Cam would predict. So, I don't think uh, I don't think this part is too surprising. But what we thought was kind of neat is that you can still say something about the final state, even though in general it's not. So, you know, thermal would be exploring everything on the microcanonical manifold, all the states with the right energy. Uh, instead, what you can do is take that hydrodynamical equation and just look for equilibrium solutions. Uh, so if you want, this is a constraint on the long time behavior. I took the Perkis hydrodynamical equation, set the time derivative to 0. And this gives me some condition on the densities. So this is the forcing term, and this is that velocity. And what that means is you get many different possible steady states depending on your initial condition. But all of them are hydrodynamical equilibria, even if they're not thermal equilibria. Um, so and you, know, you can never rule out, at least on a computer, that if you ran for the age of the universe or something, maybe eventually it would thermalize. But at least for the largest numerically accessible time scales, there are hydrodynamical equilibria for this problem, but not thermal equilibria. So hydrodynamics is useful even in the long time limit when we thought it would only be useful in the short time limit. So that's what I wanted to say about 1D. And let me now uh, move on to things a bit more experimental, uh, which means the risk of talking about other people's experiment. Uh, but I'll try to at least give my impression of some things. So uh, I think uh, the basic overview was already given very well by Andy McKenzie. So my focus is, OK, sometimes electrons in a solid are very much like a normal fluid. As you heard, they often have the kinematic viscosity of something like honey. Uh, so what are the exciting differences about electron fluids compared to normal fluids? Uh, and I think the answer is there are actually quite a few. Uh, and I hope that some of them will come up in my last 25 minutes. So obviously, something that may be a bug more than a feature is that momentum is not a perfectly conserved quantity in solids, especially once you've got disorder. Uh, Solids are not isotropic, but that can be good. I'm going to tell you about one hydrodynamic effect that is only there when you break time reversal. Uh, and of course, solids also reduce the spatial symmetry, which might be interesting for some things. Electrons are charged. At least the simplest classical fluids, like water, are not charged. And then, of course, there are differences like quantum mechanics. The fact that electrons have spin will come up later as just a useful experimental handle. Um, so I think there's a lot of stuff to do in, in solid state hydrodynamics uh, now that we've maybe started to establish that we could do ordinary hydrodynamics if we wanted to. Um, so this uh, work I'm going to talk about, the main person from Berkeley involved was uh, Tomas Scafidi. Um, and I'll show some references and connections to one of the posters from yesterday in a second. Uh, so let me go back here. Um, yeah. So there, anyway. They, I'm skipping the history because you already heard that. But the, the one slide from Andy McKenzie that I would show again, just because it's important for what follows, is this idea of three regimes going back to Gergi, that if you want to see hydrodynamical behavior uh, in, say, a thin pipe, then there are three length scales you should think about. One is length scale for momentum con or mean free path for momentum conserving collisions. One is for momentum relaxation, for example, off of impurities. And one is, say, the width of a channel. And the difference between sort of ordinary ohmic theory and a hydrodynamical regime uh, would be ohmic theory. I've, the first thing that happens is momentum relaxes. Uh, while for hydrodynamics, what we would like is something interesting where there are collisions that can serve momentum effectively. So it's not just ballistic. Uh, if w were the shortest scale, that would be the ballistic regime. Um, but instead, this system geometry length scale is in between momentum conserving and momentum relaxing mean free path. Uh, so yeah, and, and something that we'll hopefully hear about, there is a, a history here in two degs. And I mention this partly because I'm going to come back to two degs with optics in just a second. Uh, so the one thing I thought I would add, as it's hard to orthogonalize because it's great that we all have common interests and so on. So I'm going to say focus on one particular aspect and let uh, Andy discuss everything else. Uh, 
So I'll come back in a second maybe to this question of bounds on relaxation, which would be a really interesting case of quantum hydrodynamics that it's got an H bar, unlike maybe the other things I'm going to say in the moment. Um, if I ask about how could electron fluids have different hydrodynamics from ordinary water or something, one of the simplest ways is the following. Uh, an electron moving in a magnetic material or a magnetic field no longer has time reversal as a good symmetry. And if you go back to the equations of hydrodynamics and ask, are there new terms that are allowed because of that, uh, there's one which turns out to have been quite interesting for theoretical reasons for a long time. And I saw Andre Gromov was here at least early in the week, and he would be the person to ask about the history of this quantity in topological states. Um, so this quantity, the Hall viscosity, is the following. Um, normal viscosity, suppose I've got a shear flow where the gray fluid on the inside is rotating, uh, and there's a shear relative to some static blue fluid on the outside. Ordinary viscosity is a dissipative term that tends to slow down the shear, uh, bring the system closer to equilibrium. Hall viscosity is a non-dissipative term that tends to move momentum transverse to the <laughs> fluid flow direction. And I need to break time reversal so I know which way to move that momentum. Uh, formally, it's an extra piece of the stress tensor. So, and it's a piece that's time reversal odd, so we wouldn't expect it in most fluids, but it is there. So it was studied a lot in quantum Hall systems because it's a really neat example of something that is somewhat quantized. Uh, so in quantum Hall systems, we make a big deal of how sigma xy, the Hall effect, is really, really quantized. It doesn't care about the metric of space-time. It doesn't care about sample geometry, whatever. Uh, the Hall viscosity is a bit different. It's effectively quantized if you have rotational invariance or Lorentz invariance. Basically, there are symmetries that quantize it, but it's not fully topological. If you were to strain your sample, you would slightly modify the Hall viscosity. So it's uh, somewhat quantized, but only under additional assumptions that you don't need for normal quantization. So that's one reason why people studied it so much in quantum Hall states. In metals, it's relatively simple. Uh, and here, uh, I'll tell you about the calculation we did, which builds heavily on some earlier work by uh, Alexeyev in bulk. Uh, and if you want to know more about the experimental status, uh, Nabanila Nandi is here and had a nice poster that will tell you more. Um, so this is joint work with uh, her and other people from Andy's group. So one quick note, uh, the Hall viscosity, a way to sort of explain how it's different in the quantum Hall case from the metal case, and it's actually a little bit better in the metal case in some ways. Uh, one way to understand how you might actually measure this Hall viscosity is that it gives a contribution to sigma xy at order q squared. Uh, so sigma xy at q equal to zero is the famously quantized thing in a quantum Hall state. You go to order q squared, and you actually find that there are two pieces. Uh, one is the Hall viscosity that you want, and one is related to the internal compressibility and is not particularly magic or quantized. In a metal, uh, sigma xy, at least in a simple metal, is uh, very closely related to the Hall viscosity. This compressibility part is relatively small. Uh, the, the, and what we can do is uh, try to figure out how would this show up in an experiment. And I'll say one word about boundary conditions in a second. Uh, so, this would be in the bulk, but I'm going to tell you about the measurement you should do in a second. So, so far, no one has succeeded in measuring Hall viscosity in the quantum Hall state, as I know. Um, the first report I know of in a metal is uh, by one of the people here and is on a poster, and I have the reference in a second. No, but in edge channel, I wouldn't expect much viscosity. Right, no, it's, it's not in the edge channel, so, but, but it's really saying, I mean, it's something that is surprising at first. Uh, if I could measure sigma xy at non-zero q by patterning contacts or something, uh, then what in principle I should see is that there are corrections of order q squared l squared, where l is the magnetic length. Uh, and so they're not particularly small if you can get q's of order inverse magnetic length. Uh, I mean, the coefficient of that is order 1, if you like. Uh, but I don't think it turns out to be surprisingly difficult to measure that with optics, say. And as you point out, with transport, you're often really measuring the edge. Uh, so it's, it's not exactly, other people may, I don't know, maybe there's a good proposal out there, but I haven't seen any really good proposal of how to measure this in quantum hall. What about the surface acoustic noise? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I guess that is measuring at finite Q, that's true. I don't know, 
whether any of those have been interpreted. I mean, mostly, I guess I know about those measurements for the gapless states. I don't know if any of them have been interpreted this way, but it's a good point. Usually, they measure absorption. They don't measure usually the, the non-dissipative. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So more fundamentally, the difference between uh, hydrodynamic effects and ballistic effects. So, so uh, rho x y, in, once you start uh, having Q dependence or some finite geometry, would also dif uh, differ in ballistic geometries and ev will even differ, differ more. So when will we call it vis viscosity and when will we call it uh, ballistic effect with geometry? Um, well, I'm going to dodge that by saying in a moment I'll tell you how to measure it finite Q without contacts or geometry. Uh, but you're right that if you were doing a transport experiment, uh, you would have to think carefully about how to separate out geometric effects from this sort of fundamental bulk effect at non-zero Q. Uh, no, you, you can still ask it about the bulk. So whole viscosity would mean that you have a field in the y direction corresponding to a curvature in Jx in the, along the y. So the, no, no, the, but, but it's just a term that connects curvature or gradient. Mm, of you don't need it. But the, the point is, the way to measure it is just to measure sigma xy at non-zero q, uh, and then separately to measure the compressibility. So both of those are doable. Uh, of course, but, but you will you will see large deviation also if you are completely ballistic. If you're in bulk, I, I don't think there, I'll put it this way. If you compute sigma xy to order q squared from the Kubo formula, you know, it's a fundamental, in the bulk material, the only, there are only two contributions. Uh, one, you know, whether it's ballistic or not, I mean, th this is, you know, quantum Hall physics. I don't think it, I think it's fairly robust. There's just the compressibility piece and the viscosity piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand talk about ballistic regime and bulk. I mean, bulk is always bigger than the new free path. Uh, yes, but if you start, you know, patterning your bulk, you effectively access this. Uh, uh, in a sense that, uh, you know, you can ask whether ideal gas has viscosity. So ideal gas doesn't have viscosity. But if you do a different experiment, I take two plates, put ideal gas between, and ask if I move these plates, will I feel force? I would feel force. So in this sense, I think all these corrections would come in. OK, I see. But maybe a way to state it is, but OK, so if I took, you're worried that in something like an integer Hall state without interactions, I would still get terms like this. Yes. And I think, that, I think that can be true, yeah. I mean, I, I, we call it a viscosity, but I'm not sure that one, I mean, definitely there's a sigma xy response at order q squared that doesn't depend on having interactions. Uh, so that I agree with. Mm -hmm. So. The, uh, anyway, I'm going to be a little bit quick because I do want to get to some of the optical things. But first, OK, what you can do uh, is take the bulk simple estimates of uh, the viscosity terms that appear in this form of the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, and these were in the work I said by Alexeyev. And then ask, let's go to a thin channel. And if I actually try to measure rho xy, uh, how will it be modified from the bulk value by Hall viscosity effects, which show up effectively in these ratios of cyclotron length to momentum conserving mean free path? And for the simple case of no slip boundary conditions, this is what you get. Uh, we actually did a Boltzmann simulation for more complicated sort of Maxwell type boundary conditions, um, and there. Uh, you can read the paper if you want details, but effectively we think this is large enough to measure if you're in the hydrodynamical regime, but you've already heard from Andy some caveats about whether the particular material we were thinking about is strongly hydrodynamical enough for this to work and all that. But uh, by a different way of looking, uh, there's a report that the Hall viscosity has been seen in graphene, and you can see the poster and the first author uh, about that one. So I think uh, that's what I wanted to say about Paul viscosity, everything else about hydrodynamics and that class of materials, you'll have to wait for the second lecture by Professor McKenzie. Uh, I just wanted to try to explain why Hall viscosity is a somewhat unusual and interesting property of uh, fluids. So, yeah. Done, so what is the prefactor of Q squared? Anyone 
Uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a calculation I really think should be done. I even talked with a student about doing it, but I'm not sure. Maybe someone else knows if it's been done. Uh, so what we did was put on a magnetic field, but it should definitely be there under the conditions where the time reversal is in the band structure rather than in a magnetic field. Uh, but I, don't, I, I agree with you, and I think it's a great calculation, and someone should do it, and as far as I know, it hasn't been done. Okay. Oh, maybe for the massive drag model, but in general, if I gave you a. Yeah, I think that if, in general, there ought to be some expression for it. Let me think about it. Okay, there is one thing I can say. Uh, I know the answer for if you have. Okay, we, we did work on this, and we'll probably write this up soon, but it's only a partial answer. Uh, if you have two band models, you can get an expression for it and try to interpret. So in general, you write down some complicated perturbation theory expression, and I don't know what you learn by doing it. But if you have a two-band model, uh, then you get a, a few terms, and there aren't as many terms you can think about it. And if the bands are flat, then it's the following. Uh, the Hall viscosity, sigma xy to order q squared, is an integral over the Brillouin zone of the following product. Uh, one piece is the Berry curvature, and the other piece is the so-called quantum metric. And so, for example, if you do that for the Hofstadter, well, okay, if you make a, okay, the Hofstadter model is not two bands, but you, you can sort of see that the continuum value of the Hall viscosity does emerge from this perturbation theory formula as a check. Uh, but if you go to two flat bands, that's the only case I know where it has some simple geometric interpretation. In general, it's just some complicated perturbation theory expression. Uh, but the, if you, so the, in a sense, the Berry curvature is the imaginary part of something, and the quantum metric is the real part of the same thing made out of the wave functions, and the product of them is what controls it in one case. But that's the only case I know. Okay, other, other Hall viscosity questions are now uh, how to avoid using contacts if you want to. So I'm going to explain what the data is at the bottom right, but uh, this is an experiment from the mid-2000s. In fact, the first time I visited Weitzman was in 2008, and I talked about this experiment. Uh, so I had to dig out my old slides with the title Weitzman. Uh, but it turns out that it's now topical again, because it's really a very direct measurement of the ballistic to diffusive crossover in a very clean two-dimensional electron gas without having to make contacts. Uh, and I think it, you know, now that we know a lot more about, for example, the Q dependence of sigma and things like that, it would be great either to analyze the old data or to get some new data uh, and maybe look for other hydrodynamical effects, including the time domain. Uh, because we know that, for example, ordinary fluids, they're interesting statically, but they're maybe even more interesting dynamically. So maybe optics would be a way to do some actual time dynamics of hydrodynamics of electrons. So the idea, this was, a, when I talked about it 10 years ago, it was from the point of view of spin transport and spin physics and so on. Uh, now, spin is just going to be an accessory, a useful thing. Um, but even back then, you know, we, we wanted to understand differences between uh, ballistic and hydrodynamic behavior. So the point is going to be using high frequency short wavelength light uh, you can actually measure transport at fairly long wavelengths, like micron wavelengths, by making a so-called transient grating. And I'll tell you what that is in a moment. Uh, it doesn't, it, it's not that easy to do in every material. Uh, so this was uh, Chris Weber and New Gettick were students of Joe Ornstein who uh, did this work. Um, the, the, you can measure spin transport, energy transport, charge transport, whatever, but uh, this is going to be about Coulomb interaction hydrodynamics, but it's observed using spin, and I'll explain why. Basically, the idea is that normal transport in a momentum-conserving system, you don't notice the momentum-conserving mean free path very directly. Uh, here, if you look at spin transport in the right way, you do, because a certain kind of spin current is sensitive to momentum-conserving collisions when ordinary charge current is not. Uh, so these are going to be pictures of how a certain ripple of density uh, vanishes as a function of time. So let me tell you how the ripple was created, and it's measured by the same process, basically. So you take two lasers. Uh, you could view this as almost like a kind of long wavelength, long time neutron scattering. Uh, I'm going to tell you the spin version, but you could also do it with density if you wanted. So take one linearly polarized light beam coming in at this angle with polarization like that. 
take another linearly polarized light beam coming in with polarization into the board, and then as you move along horizontally, uh, if you want which crest gets there first varies, uh, the phase difference between these two waves, so you get something that goes like right circular, left circular, right circular, left circular. If you do this in gallium arsenide, one reason why optics people love gallium arsenide is that you can pump spin density. So you can basically make a grading of spin density, and this material uh, has a spin relaxation time at accessible temperatures of 100 picoseconds or more. Uh, so if you're measuring faster than 100 picoseconds, spin is not disappearing. It might move around. Uh, but that's why, you know, spin currents are not really well defined usually in the DC limit, but this is not the DC limit and they are pretty well defined on the time scales I'm talking about. So what's going to happen is this grading is going to decay, not because the spins are just going back to zero, but because they're moving around. Uh, so it's really a transport process rather than a spin relaxation process. Um, so this is in zero magnetic field and it's also uh, a, a two deg, it can be very clean, so there is going to be Coulomb interaction, and Coulomb interaction, I want to convince you, can degrade spin currents even when it's not degrading charge currents, and basically it can transfer momentum from spin up to spin down, so that's why this is called spin Coulomb drag. It's basically Coulomb drag between the upspin sector and the downspin sector. Uh, and what I have to say about this theoretically is very simple, almost trivial, because, you know, it was before uh, many new realizations were made about two-dimensional electrons that you heard about in Leonid Levitov's talk, so uh, I think it would be good to go back and revisit this. So here's the basic idea. So forget about umclap. Momentum is conserved. I've got uh, time running up. I've got an up electron going to the right and a down electron going to the left, and they bounce off each other. So the only importance of spin in this is that it's a way to tell apart electrons. It's like a flavor or a color, uh, which you wouldn't have with spinless electrons. Uh, basically, momentum is conserved. Total charge current is unchanged by this collision, but spin current has flipped uh, because now up is going to the left and down is going to the right. So the point is just this one line. Even with spin conserved and even with momentum conserved, spin current is not conserved because there are momentum conserving collisions that don't modify the electron current, but they do modify the spin current. Uh, and as a result, if you're in a collision dominated regime, you find that spin density diffuses much more slowly than charge density. Um, and you can control what regime you're in just by temperature. Um, so this is a little bit about the theory that was actually done, but I don't want to get too much into that. You can as I said, you could go back and do this better now, but you can make some approximation for uh, effectively what is S of Q omega. So a nice thing about this being a semiconductor is that the Fermi temperature is something like room temperature. So by just going a little bit below room temperature, you can be in the normal metal regime with temperature much less than E Fermi, but if you're at room temperature, then it's more classical. Uh, so what you can compute is how does the spin diffusion constant, which is the decay of this grating, compare to the charge diffusion constant. And you can see very clearly one of the effects we've already been talking about in this conference, which is the following. If you have a metal and you go to low temperature, then you actually go from hydrodynamic to ballistic just because metals at low temperature have very little scattering for the same reason that the Fermi liquid is stable. So Landau told us that there's just not enough phase space for scattering at low temperature in a metal above 1D. And that's actually seen here. Uh, so you, you get into a ballistic regime, and now let me go back to the experimental data and, and show you what you see. Well, if I look at these plots, so this is the amplitude of the grading as a function of time. Uh, so at 91 Kelvin, it's just a smooth, more or less exponential decay. And that's what I would expect, and you can verify that it fits diffusion. If I were going to look at this amplitude in the diffusive case, it would just be like some e to the minus spin diffusion constant q squared t. Uh, so that's what I call diffusive. And again, what's setting the spin diffusion constant is not impurities, it's really the Coulomb collisions. Uh, so that's why this is so much lower than the charge diffusion constant. 
As you lower the temperature, you see there start to be wiggles, and eventually it looks maybe a bit like a Bessel function. So this is 5 Kelvin, not super low. What's going on here is, well, we started with some ripple. Suppose I had some ripple of density, and I let this propagate freely, and I'm scattering off that ripple, so that's what the signal is. Then you'd expect that if I've got a well-defined velocity, there'll be some kind of revival, uh, which is this extra peak at the point when uh, the time is something like uh, the wavelength of this grating over V Fermi. And again, the wavelength of the grating is microns or so, so this is saying that there's some level of ballistic propagation at the level of a micron, which in these gallium arsenide 2 eggs at 5 Kelvin is believable. Uh, um, I don't know whether 5 Kelvin is low enough to eliminate that. It, it, it wasn't considered. Was it? Not in this experiment. Um, I, I don't think that it was considered as an explanation for what's no, going on. All this, 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 this spin drag stuff is gone. Is that? No. Yes. No. I think it's. We haven't chat about it. I mean, there's a paper by my, my, my own group about 10 years later that showed that everything was not. Everything was, was uh, you, you think these optical? So what you do is you locally th heat uh, your, your, your sample, so you create hotspots for photons and they drag the electrons along. I agree with you for the transport experiments, but not for the optical experiments, but we should talk. No. Should okay. Okay, well now. Uh, this is way too much power. That's your, always the problem with these optical experiments. Um, I don't think this is a local heating effect, but uh, I mean, for me, I just think it would be hard to this is a school. Uh, well, I don't. Uh, well, I don't think that, that. I don't think you can get that shape out of phonon drag. But anyway, we should we should chat. Uh, um, I, I don't think. Let me put it this way. I don't think the authors. I think I would have heard if the authors had abandoned it. But uh, yeah. They've done something else. There was after that paper. There was also a transport measurement on UBC by um, George Polk, and he saw spatial gratings induced by current spin polarized current from a QPC. And they, they were low, low range, and they could detect them far away, and they were free from that problem. Uh, so it wasn't an optical measurement, and they saw, they saw those greetings. And they are, you believe, free from phonon drag concerns? That I, I'm not so sure about that one either. Um, yeah, I think it was, <coughs> was lower, lower temperature than that, was, was in the Kelvin. Yeah, but you locally the Kelvin create the but I don't think there's that much, I mean, it's not a super intense laser press. I don't think there's that much heating uh, in this. Besides locally, like the whole thing, yeah. they're locally recombined. So you locally make some heat, and some of them go into optical photos. They're not, they're not exactly recombining. I mean, you're locally, you, you have a, you know, if, if they recombined, there wouldn't be any signal left. But you, you do heat because you lower to an effective electron temperature. I agree with that. But the effective electron temperature is not high enough, I think, for phonon drag to be significant. No, but that, that, look, you're going to tell me that, you know, Ornstein, who I think is a, a, one of the more careful optics experimenters out there, would not have thought about making sure the rep rate is low enough they don't heat. I don't, I don't believe that. He's thinking going cycles. Okay, well, anyway, so now you have... <laughs> well, then it was gone again, and now... No, the, the physics is so simple, I think. Anyway, so now you have a challenge as students. You have two theorists versus one experimentalist. And I agree, one experimentalist probably outweighs two theorists, but we'll have to talk about it. And <laughs> fortunately, science is not a vote, so we'll try to figure it out. All right. So if I could have one last, OK. Uh, I'm going to skip the McKenzie plot, because McKenzie's here. Uh, you'll hear about why that's interesting later on. So here, uh, this is actually the question that I was asked about, uh, what about anomalous Hall type cases? So one sort of active area, and I want to use it to lead into my last five-minute topic, is uh, Let's take advantage of the fact we're in a solid. So one way to think about, one way to derive the equations of fluid mechanics, or one example where you could derive them if you wanted, is Boltzmann equation starting point, so dilute <coughs> gas of particles. Uh, when we're in a solid, we really need to include sort of berry phase corrections. And I think Dima Pesson will probably talk about some consequences of this kind of thing in solids. Um, this is the so-called anomalous velocity, or the berry phase contribution. Basically, the equation of motion for electrons in a metal has a piece that is left out of the old textbooks, but is starting to appear in the new textbooks. And it comes from the berry phase of the block wave function. So I think someone, I hope, will say more about that later on. Uh, what I want to talk about now is an 
second order optical effect, so I believe linear optics to him. Uh, there's something in second order optics that I think is very interesting in Wiles. I don't know if it's hydrodynamical, but I've only got a few minutes left, so I think I can sneak in something. Uh, because there are a lot of claims of hydrodynamical behavior in Wiles semimetals, and it would be interesting to understand whether people here have a consensus on those. Uh, I guess this is something that I think is very likely to be interesting in Wiles semimetals. So since we have this new kind of metal, I'm going to claim that there's an optical property that if you measure it will be, uh, first of all, stronger than in other materials, and second, approximately quantized. So the optical effect I'm talking about uh, in low frequency limit is one of the sort of simple Berry phase effects worked out around 2010 or so. Uh, the basic idea, one way to see an effect of this term, so this is the same term that causes the anomalous Hall effect, the intrinsic anomalous Hall effect, and so on. If you apply low frequency circularly polarized light to an inversion breaking 2 deg, like gallium arsenide cut along some directions can do this, say, uh, what you'll find is that the electron density uh, makes circles because it's pulled by the circularly polarized light. The ordinary velocity, you can probably convince yourself, averages out in such a circle, but the anomalous velocity does not. So you get a current which is more or less a direct measurement of the Berry phase. That's great. Uh, you know, it gets more complicated once you think about scattering properly and things like that. If you go to non-zero frequency, this is a second order optical effect because it's a current going like intensity. So just a photocurrent, but that's what people in optics think of as second order. There's something very special about this effect at non-zero frequency in while semimetals. So uh, if you want an analogy, there's a very cute little fact that if you take a sheet of graphene and you hold it up to the light, you're actually measuring the fine structure constant. I don't know if you've heard this, but the sheet of graphene blocks about 2.3% of that light. And that 2.3% is pi times alpha, pi times 1 over 137, the fine structure constant. So there are actually roughly quantized effects at non-zero frequency in metals. It's not part in a billion quantization like Quantum Hall. It's maybe part in 100 quantization, but it's still pretty cute. So this is an equivalent of that in Wiles. The basic idea is if you can make a Weyl semimetal, and I'm sorry for not saying enough about Weyl semimetals, but I'm sure in a day or two you'll hear a lot more about them. You can make a material that has these linear crossings. And if you find the right material with low spatial symmetry, you can put them at different energies then you can tune it so you get optical transitions across one, uh, while at the other while point, the optical transition across the while point is polyblock. So instead, you just get, say, ordinary intraband transitions. The circular photogalvanic effect, the second order photocurrent for circularly polarized light, was calculated for intraband a long time ago and is not very large. If you calculate it for interband, you get something a bit surprising. Uh, which is that the rate at which you inject current from transitions across a while node with non-zero frequency optics is e cubed over h squared times some numbers times the intensity times a topological integer, which is basically how much difference in churn number did you make between above and below the uh, Fermi surface. So, and some of you may know, tantalum arsenide, the main wild semi-metal that people have studied, has remarkably strong second order optics, but it's not this effect. Uh, that material actually has too many mirror planes to have this effect. So there's already known to be strong second order effects in wild semi-metals for different reasons. Uh, but this would be a little bit more fundamental and somewhat more surprising because this is of order 50 times larger than is normally seen for the circular photogalvanic effect. Um, so it would be a nice quantized nonlinear optical effect, as far as I know, the first one. Um, and then before people who work on topological phases ask me, this is not at all protected by anything, basically. It, it's got power law corrections in tau. It is susceptible to interactions, most likely, and so on. Uh, so that's uh, you know, the disadvantage of working in metals, I guess. But at least there should be an approximately quantized optical effect in metals, and I would love for someone to see it. Um, so quantized under the assumption of no interaction and no disorder. Yes. Um, so if you if you prefer, I think experimentally it's probably more like this is a natural scale. But the point is the natural. You know, that is to say, if someone saw this within fifty percent, we would not be disappointed. We would be jumping up and down in happiness. Uh, 
because it would still be you know, 25 times larger than this effect has been in other materials. Uh, it's the size. It's, it's partly the size and just the fact that, yeah, somehow the, the, the not, yeah, it, it, OK, I'll put it this way. In, at low frequency, it just measures basically the strength of the Berry curvature. And that can be anything. You know, the, the, there's no, the, the strength of the Berry curvature is sort of at the gamma point. So there's no natural unit or scale for it. And this is saying, for a while point, at least the starting point that you should perturb away from is this value, yeah. which is sort of an interesting value. So that's why we would love for someone to see it, because optics in general is not you know, famous for quantized things. But I did mention that graphene example, so such things are possible. Uh, so I think with that, uh, thank you for your patience and for listening to one not very hydrodynamical thing. But hopefully what this indicates maybe in Wiles is that some, you know, there are already some beautiful claims about uh, connections to theories of gravity and so on in hydrodynamics of wild semi-metals, which I don't know if anyone's going to talk about. But uh, if that all works out, that's fantastic. Uh, so I guess the message is electron metals uh, can maybe be even more interesting, electron fluids even more interesting than ordinary fluids, <laughs> which are already very interesting. So thank you. Um, let's see. So the, the calculation of it that works pretty well uh, is RPA level screening. It's nothing very fancy. It's by D'Amico and Vignale. Uh, <coughs> so I would say it, it does take into account some level of screening. And the degree of screening depends on where the temperature is compared to the Fermi level. Of, you know, this is a semiconductor. So you can't assume that temperature is small compared to E Fermi. Uh, but it, it's not, I mean, I'll put it this way. To get the number right, you need to include screening. To get the picture right, it, it's not dramatically changed by the screen Coulomb interaction. Yeah. Right, so how much is this uh, picture, for the loss of me, how much is the picture changed when you apply a magnetic field? Right? I'm just thinking, in tantalum arts, not if the problem is the like, mirror plane, we'll just break it by applying the <coughs> magnetic field. Um, so basically, what that would mean is that you could see it in principle, but you'd have to be at extremely low frequencies, and you'd have to have an extremely clean sample. So you could ask, over what frequencies is this going to work? And the idea is, uh, your upper limit on frequency is the splitting, which you know, if you're inducing it by a magnetic field or something like that, it's not going to be very large. And your lower limit is that omega needs to be greater than 1 over tau, where tau is some relaxation time, or else you kind of lose the effect. So the problem is, I think you could make a small splitting by various methods in tantalum arsenide, but you'd have to have the material be clean enough, say, that you could measure it in terahertz or even lower. And I don't think it's possible to do that. Uh, so the, 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 you know, the kind of material that I think is worth looking at are things where if you can get this to be half an electron volt or something, then it doesn't have to be super, super clean in order to measure it. 